All right, good morning, church. As you can see, we're in a, a new location in front of our pulpit and stage, and i uh, got something very special for you today. Um, you know, we've been reading in our reading plan, and I just wanted to share this with you because it, it was something that stuck out to me this week, and it was found in Proverbs chapter 3. If you're with us in the reading plan, you'll, you'll know that we read that this week. But, you know, there's so many things going on, so much chaos going on. And chapter 3, verse 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I think that's, a, that's an easy thing for us to do. We say, okay, I can trust in God, and, and that's not a problem, and that's part of believers. We, we put our trust in God. And then it says this, and do not lean on your own understanding. I think that's the, one of the toughest ones for us to do is try to reason why everything seems to be going on and why all the, the chaos that we keep reading about is going on. And, and Lord, where are you? We need you. And he says, listen, just trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. And verse 6 says this, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Well, I know this has been an encouragement for me this week, and I've just really held on to that scripture as I've just, you know, been hearing about just what's been happening in our country. Well, a couple quick announcements, then we'll pray, and then we'll get right into the word this morning. Um, happy Memorial Day. Uh, thank you, everyone that has helped serve our country, and, and we, today we're remembering those uh, that have given their life for our country, and we will never stop doing that here at Country Church. Um, here, at, here, here this morning, I know that we are presenting uh, a check for, we did a 30-hour famine, our youth did. They were able to raise over $3,000 to Beyond Vision Ministry, so we are going to be presenting that check here to John and Karen Skoog as well to, to send over to Africa and help the orphanage over there or, uh, as well. So um, our senior lunch is coming up this Wednesday, June 1st. Uh, we have a VBS meeting uh, June 5th, right after church. So VBS is coming up, camp's coming up in June. Uh, all types of things going on. Check our website just to make sure you know what's, going, what's happening here. It's so many things uh, just continually be coming up the, up the line here. Well, let's pray for our kids. And I know the Lord has really laid on my heart. I know there was a shooting down in Texas. And this morning, we're just going to pray for those families and we're going to trust in the Lord and lead not on our own understanding and not on what the news shows us and not on what Facebook tells us, but we're going to lean, we're going to trust in God and lean on, not on our own understanding. Um, so Father, we just thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we thank you for the children we have here, God, and I want to lift up all these families, Lord, uh, down in Texas, God, and, and the tragedy that happened, Father, and, and we pray just like we were reading yesterday at the men's group, Lord, that, that Lord, things are to bring glory to you. And we, we don't understand why these things happen, and, but we do trust in you. And we pray that, Lord, people will turn to you during this tragedy, Lord, and, and people will, will come back to you once again, Lord. And we pray that as a nation, Lord, people will, will Lord, will turn from our own ways and seek after you. Lord, humble us, Father. We lift up our children up here. We lift up Riverside and Deer Park, and we pray that you just watch over them. Keep them safe, Lord. Keep our kids safe, Lord. Watch over our teachers as they're finishing up the school year, Lord, to finish strong. Father, we, we also thank you for all that you've given us, Father, and we pray that you bless this offering, Lord. I pray that you bless those that can give, Father, and those that can't. I just pray that you bless them, Lord, this week so they have something to offer you next week. Lord, we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a special guest for you today. Uh, uh, I'm going to have Jacob Olson come share the message. He, has, he is co-leading our men's group as well with his father. And as a church, we want to invest in him and as a young man. And with what he has coming up this summer, I'm going to let him share a little more. But please welcome Jacob Olson. The floor is all yours. All righty. Well, good morning, church. And those of you online, good morning. Um, so my name is Jacob Olson, like Pastor Jose said, and I've been coming to this church for probably about uh, three years now. Um, and this church has just, you know, really become a, a home to me and my family. And um, we just love you guys. And I'm really excited to be able to share with you guys this morning. I'm just going to share a little bit about camp, a little bit about my testimony, um, and a lot of scripture and just what I feel like the Lord's been uh, calling me to talk to you guys about today. Um, so, uh, you know, just for a little background, um, growing up, you know, I always had kind of a, a picture of what mission work uh, looked like. Um, and I think, you know, 
growing up for me especially it was just kind of a very rigid you know you were either super extreme living in the sticks uh, in Ecuador or Papua New Guinea um, and it was kind of a, an all or nothing um, idea of what mission work looked like um, and you know as I've grown up that's changed obviously but a lot of what that had to do with was actually my grandparents and my dad's upbringing um, they actually my, my grandfather was a uh, missionary pilot with uh, MAF, which is uh, M uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship, um, and a lot of what his job was um, was you know flying supplies to to missionaries in, in villages all over all over the world really, um, and so you know they would do medical drops and um, you know emergency evacs and stuff like that, um, and you know they lived uh, all sorts of places. Um, you know, they spent time in Ethiopia, Ecuador, Mexico, um, and possibly the most challenging place of all, they did spend some time in California. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, they did spend time there, but that probably wasn't the most challenging of their um, adventures. Um, and so growing up, uh, you know, I heard all sorts of stories about, um, you know, what that mission work looked like for them and uh, how, you know, the Lord worked in incredible ways um, just throughout my dad's childhood. Um, and how that uh, affected him growing up um, and just the, the provision that they um, experienced um, and also just the powerful ministry that they were able to be a part of. Um, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, the missionaries that were um, killed by the Harani tribe in Ecuador um, while they were trying to minister to him, my grandpa actually got to work with that tribe directly after um, after that tribe had received the gospel, um, because of brave men like that, the, you know, uh, we mainly hear about Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, but there was also Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Roger uh, Yowderain, um, and those, those men all gave their lives in ministry, um, and uh, they, they dedicated their life to ministry in life and in death, and now they're rejoicing with the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and uh, they got to take part in that, and my, my grandfather and my, my dad got to, and their whole family got to take part in that too, just growing up and being able to work directly with that tribe, and it's just a very uh, powerful story, and that, you know, always had a very big effect on me. Um, Nate Saint was always one of my heroes growing up, and, um, you know, it's just a very, very powerful story. If you haven't heard the story, I encourage you to look into it. It's all over the internet. You can, you can find it anywhere. Um, but yeah, just extremely powerful. Um, and so... Um, some of those stories I was talking about, uh, my, that my, my grandparents and um, my uh, dad and his siblings experienced. Um, my grandfather, at one point, when he was a pilot in Ecuador, he actually, um, he, there was this point in time where there was a tornado and he actually you know, flew right through it on accident. Uh, he lost all instruments on the plane. Um, and it was just a you know very scary thing, and the plane actually crashed. It was a very devastating crash, and you know that provision and protection that I was talking about that you know the Lord gave to them. Um, my my grandfather pretty much he he walked out without a scratch. Um, I'm pretty sure he had a slight concussion and maybe some bruises, but um, there's a picture in the slideshow of the the aftermath of it, and um, he had a few passengers with him. I think it was one or two. Um, and, you know, if you look at the wreckage of the plane, you, you know, I would think, you know, there's no way that they would be alive today if it wasn't for the, the grace of God and um, his protection uh, over their lives. Um, and so that, you know, it was stories like that where, you know, these people that were, I mean, very kind of hardcore in the ministry and very dedicated uh, throughout their whole, whole entire life. Um, and after, you know, after his work with MAF, he became a flight instructor at Moody Aviation Fellowship. Um, and there was just uh, this idea of complete dedication and devotion to the ministry and to sharing the gospel with people that have not heard it before. Um, and it's just been really incredible. I've had a lot of people like that in my life. Um, my grandparents, my sister Hannah, she's uh, serving in YWAM uh, over in Australia right now. And just time and time again. So, so like I said, um, that was definitely shaped a lot of my um, kind of ideology of what ministry looked like growing up. Um, and as you can guess, today I'm, you know, I'm not preaching to tell you that is what it looks like. I think uh, ministry, um, it, it speaks nothing of occupational exclusiveness and it doesn't, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say, so you want to be a missionary? Well, you're going to have to quit your job, move to Ecuador and live out in the sticks for a while. Um, I think that the ministry here where you're at and where um, God has placed you right now is incredibly important and is just as thirsty as it is over there. 
Um, and there's just incredible opportunities uh, if we just take hold of them and um, answer the call that the Lord has given us. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think oftentimes the, the ministry at home and in America, uh, we, we kind of take for granted the, um, the luxuries we have. And so that kind of causes us to sometimes kind of undersell the, the need and the want and the, the drive that we should have for sharing the gospel here at home. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from t this morning. Uh, and I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit about camp and how that has been the ministry that I've been able to take part in and I'm looking forward to returning to this summer. So our first kind of section we're going to go over with um, is, is about zeal. Um, so zeal is defined as great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Um, and I think zeal is just the perfect word to describe um, what our relationship with Christ should be and what our relationship with ministry should be and just how that should look in, uh, you know, in our lifestyle um, and also just in exclusive ministry opportunities. Um, I think we're told all the time in America that, you know, we, are, we, have, we all have roles in the church. Um, and the, the roles I'm particularly talking about are there are the people that go and there are the people that send uh, in regards to missionaries. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, there are people that are called to um, go and um, be a kind of active, exclusive, a part of that ministry. And then there are people here that, you know, stay home and they support them financially. They support them through, through prayer. Um, and those are absolutely necessary. And, and true, I, I absolutely think that's true. But I think oftentimes um, w when we're given that role to um, you know, stay at home and support financially and through prayer, uh, we, get, we get pretty comfortable with that. And I think that um, we, myself included, um, we kind of dismiss ourselves and excuse ourselves from the role of actually actively sharing the gospel because we, we kind of look at it sometimes as well, that's kind of what we're giving them money for. We're kind of paying them to do that. Um, and I think that, you know, like I said, the role of giving and the role of going are definitely absolutely necessary. And I think that that definitely brings, brings glory to God. But there's also a very active need for, for me and for you in your life that we are also active um, ministers in our everyday life, whether that be at work or at school. Um, I, think, I think those are all often undersold and just that, um, you know, your, your place of work is a mission field and your, your school, if you're going to school, is a mission field. And even more importantly, your home, um, you know, your home is, is a mission field and whether you have siblings or parents or um, kids, I mean, those are, those are just uh, kind of, it's so necessary to be able to be active and um, just constantly sharing the gospel through um, through your, your actions and how you conduct yourself, but also through words. Um, I think that's another thing that's also very dangerous is it's just that um, we kind of undersell the um, necessity for words and uh, words also. And I think, you know, a lot of people, we kind of sit behind the, we lead by example, which is, like I said, is absolutely true. And that's necessary. But there also comes a time and place where there needs to be direct um, affirmation of the gospel and uh, proclamation of the gospel um, verbally because um, you know people can sit back and uh, wonder why you know why that guy's such a such a great guy and why um, you know he you know all sorts of examples um, just that that can be a great person but that if you don't verbally proclaim the gospel of Christ and why um, you are that way then there's going to be I mean it's really not sharing the gospel with them and it is leading by example but there's there's got to be more direct um, driving at that um, so, um, this, that's definitely something that I, has confronted me with my time at camp. For those of you that don't know, for the past couple of years I've been serving at uh, Kokolala Lake Bible Camp, and for those of you uh, that, um, you know, haven't heard of that before, it's a, a pretty small camp just south of Sandpoint over in Idaho, and serving at, at this camp has definitely been one of the biggest honors of my life, and I, um, you know, when I first started at camp, I was probably a foot shorter um, and, you know, way less grown up than I am now. Um, but, you know, it's definitely just had a huge impact on, on me and the person that I am today. And funnily enough, I actually never attended the summer camps, 
before I started working there, I attended a series of the backpacking camps there, which are just incredible. If you guys ever get the chance to go backpacking, I encourage you to do it. Um, just being able to absorb God's creation like that and just get to experience that firsthand is just incredible. And I, I can't talk about that enough. It's just a very, very incredible personal experience. Um, and that, so the backpacking was kind of what got me started with camp. And ever since then, you know, I've just kind of been sticking my foot more and more in the door. Um, and eventually I started, uh, I put in an application and I became a staff member there. Um, and so you kind of have your, your general staff members where um, you are, you know, you serve once or twice, you know, one or two weeks out of the year. Um, and then, you know, you go home. Uh, and so I did that for a year or two, and then, and then last year was my first year actually as a, what's called an ISSM, which is an in-faith summer staff missionary. Uh, the camp is under the umbrella of in-faith, which was uh, formerly known as the American Sunday School Association. It's a very uh, large uh, mission organization, um, and so they were actually the founders of this camp, and it has since then changed to in-faith uh, ministries, and so... Um, so yeah, getting to be a part of that is just really, really incredible. Um, and this camp has had a huge effect on who I am and the relationships I've made there are ones that I anticipate lasting a lifetime. Um, and it's just really, really incredible. And I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going back this year and I think it's just gonna be a really great opportunity to um, just spread the gospel more with these kids. Um, we, we have hundreds of kids uh, throughout the Throughout the year, um, I think our biggest camp last year was about 300 kids that were there for one week. That was for the 11 and 12 age group. So they have a uh, teen camp, they have 11 and 12 uh, year olds age group, and they have nine and 10 year olds and seven and eight year olds. And so that four, pretty much four weeks of camp, and then there's a family camp also. Um, and just a really great opportunity to, um, for me, just to have fellowship with my other staff members, um, and also just get the opportunity to share the gospel with these kids. It's just very, very exciting. Um, and I'm, I'm just overjoyed that I get to go back again this year um, and just take part in that ministry. But um, kind of the point of what I'm going to be talking about you, uh, with you guys today, or what I am talking about with you guys today, um, in the idea of zeal, is that that does not only apply to, um, you know, my time at camp. Um, and oftentimes, oftentimes I treat it like it does. And I think it's really easy to have zeal and that enthusiasm and that drive and that excitement for the gospel when you're in a healthy, flourishing environment where God and the gospel are the, the main goal of the entire um, reason you're there. Um, and I just think that, you know, when you get comfortable in that environment, you know, it's very easy to be zealously um, pursuing a relationship with Christ and, you know, having drive and motivation to pursue that but then you get home and you're you know back at work or for me personally when I'm you know back at work going back to school whatever that looks like I find that 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 um, excitement that I had for the gospel during camp and during um, you know while I was in that season it definitely kind of starts to dwindle and I you know find myself just not being quite as excited and um, motivated to share the gospel or you know sometimes even pursue my my own relationship with Christ like I should um, and so I think the, my theme verse at camp um, has been Colossians 3, 22 uh, to, to 25. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think it's something that I need to apply to my life as well, not just my theme verse at camp. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that for you guys right now. So uh, verse 22 of Colossians 3 says, Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as someone, uh, something done for the Lord and not for men. Uh, 24. Knowing that you will receive a reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back whatever uh, wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Um, so I just love this passage, and you know, I think particularly I want to focus on mainly 23 and 24. I think those are probably the best verses in the Bible that... Um, really portray what our relationship with Christ and what our um, experience in ministry should look like. Um, the wholeheartedness in, that is mentioned in verse 23 where it says, um, in everything you do, work wholeheartedly in fearing the Lord. I mean, that's just a huge, huge factor in what our ministry should look like and how, how, how it applies to our personal lives too. And that, um, you know, when we're uh, pursuing a relationship with Christ, we're pursuing that wholeheartedly and we're, we're in it for the, you know, 
for, for the long run, in the long haul, um, in that we are devoting everything we have wholeheartedly to our relationship with Christ, to sharing the gospel, and to proclaiming victory, the victory that we have through Christ. And I think that's just a huge message um, that is just really incredible. And then also in verse 23, or in verse 24, um, where it talks about that uh, enthusiasm and... Um, Okay, wait, hang on, sorry, I messed that up. The wholeheartedness is in verse 22, and the, the enthusiasm is in verse 23. Um, the enthusiasm where it says, and whatever you do, do it enthusiastically, as if it was something done for the Lord and not for man. Um, and that, I think that is mainly the verse that applies in every regard of our life, whether that be at work, at school, um, at home. Um, you know, oftentimes we get stuck in kind of the monotony of our, our everyday lives, and we kind of... Um, Forget why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and this verse just talks about that. And everything you do, it, it should be for the Lord. And you should treat it as if you were doing this to glorify God. Um, and I think that that's, it's a form of um, just praising the Lord. Um, and it's a form of worship, just even if, in the stuff that seems ridiculous. You're, when you're at work and you're you know, doing paperwork or whatever, um, or you know, fixing something, you know, it, I think oftentimes... We kind of do that mindlessly, but the fact of the matter is, we, if we do that with the right attitude, it can be a form of worship. And, um, you know, treat it as if you were doing it for the Lord and have that enthusiasm and take advantage of that and take joy in that. Um, and I just think that, that that's something that's really exciting and it's something that I need to apply to uh, my life personally. I struggle with that a lot is just um, kind of dealing with the monotony and the um, just feeling like some of the stuff that I do is pointless and, you know, going to work or going to school, it just feels like I'm not really accomplishing anything. But the fact of the matter is, with the right heart and the right attitude and um, treating it as if I was doing it for the Lord and for the glory of God, um, I can take joy and in, in have enthusiasm in whatever I'm doing with that. And so I think that that's definitely really exciting and something that I need to work on. Um, but like I said, year after year when camp season is over, that enthusiasm kind of dwindles and dies down a little bit. And I constantly have to remind myself that the title of In Faith Summer Staff Missionary, uh, or ISSM for short, does not define my biblical calling. Um, and, you know, same goes for, you know, people of the congregation. The, someone who ties the church does not define your biblical calling. Um, we are not called to these individual tasks alone, but we are called to a lifestyle that emulates the love of Christ and our passion for sharing the gospel and um, being fishers of men. Um, so Matthew 16, uh, 24 to 28 says, uh, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants uh, to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. Uh, verse 26, What will benefit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Verse 28, I assure you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I believe that God has called me to camp for a season. I absolutely believe that with my whole heart, um, and I'm very excited about that. But something that I need to acknowledge and work on, um, just living every day uh, based on this, is that it is only for a season. Camp is for a season um, in my life. And Matthew 16 does not call me to lay down my summers exclusively to work at camp for a little while. It calls me to lay down my entire life in verse 24. And that's mainly the verse I want to kind of drive at. Um, in, you know, it just talks about, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself. He must lay down his life before, before Christ and, um, and take up his cross and follow him. Um, and so that does not just involve me laying down my summers and saying, here, Lord, you can have my summers, but the rest of this is me time. Um, it is a very, very broad, um, that, uh, a broad you know, verse that encompasses everything. It should involve everything in my life. Um, and once camp is over, the ministry is not over. The, the call to lay down my life, take up my cross and follow him is not over, and that is still completely applicable. Um, and that's something that I definitely need to work on myself. But even for, you know, um, you guys also, um, he is not calling you to lay down Sunday mornings to listen to a sermon or to go, go to church and, um, and tithe. He, he is, those are commandments, but 
Um, and he's not calling you to, you know, just listen to the radio and positive life radio while you're driving. He is calling you to a life uh, and a lifestyle of devotion and enthusiasm and um, zeal for what he has done for you and zeal for you wanting to share that with other people. Um, and I think that that's a very, very powerful message and something that we often um, kind of, you know, kind of undersell and just um, don't, don't communicate that strongly enough. And I think that it's a very, very important thing that we are not called to serve the Lord in seasons and we are not called to um, lay down our si- our, ourselves and our lives for a season. We are called to completely and um, just zealously pursue Him and strive to um, share his gospel and um, the, the good word of the Lord. Um, so uh, with that in mind, um, you know, I just think that mission work has never been seasonal and more importantly, it has never been something that only applies to camp or in Ecuador for my grandparents or, you know, Papua New Guinea or anything. I mean, it is, uh, a, it is a, a calling for any time and anywhere. And especially for where you are right now, it is a call of consistency and devotion and a calling that is greater than ourselves. So how do we hold fast to zeal for the gospel when we are going back to the monotony of our everyday lives after, you know, you get back from an exciting youth conference or um, something like that where you were so excited and on fire for the gospel and then you get home and, you know, you just feel like, you know, well, I'm home now. Um, So how do we hold on to that? Um, So that brings us to section two, uh, and I've titled that, God has placed uh, you where you are. Um, And I think it's incredibly important to note that in the Bible, it was very, very uncommon for the people God chose to be his missionaries um, to be exclusively missionaries. Um, For example, five of the apostles, Peter, John, Andrew, James, and Philip, were fishermen full-time. Um, and Luke was a physician, Matthew a tax collector, Paul was a tent maker, David of the Old Testament who wrote Psalms and Proverbs, he was a, um, a shepherd turned king, um, and Jesus himself was a carpenter. As I said before, ministry really does not call for exclusivity in your occupation, and there is, um, you know, ministry is something that is very, very alive and um, in every walk of life, and that, um, you know, you are not necessarily commanded to be exclusively a missionary, um, but you are commanded to live out your lifestyle um, as a missionary would in the things that you are doing. Um, so, uh, let's see, where am I at here? Um, I believe that these men in the Bible were um, called because they were hard workers, and in some cases, their occupation was of worth to the ministry. Um, and it helped, with the help of Jesus, they could identify with the, with the mission. For example, with the fishermen, he used the analogy of being fishers of men. That was something that they could connect with and um, they would understand because of their occupation. And I, I believe that that is applicable for everybody in whatever they do, you know, for, for a living, whether that is exclusively a missionary or if you, you know, you drive a truck or something. I mean, there, there is some reason that God has put you where you are. Um, and I think that's very, very important to remember that um, there is a reason that God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. Um, this also applies to the roles at camp. Every role from the directors to the cooks to the cabin leaders, Timothys or programmers um, and all the other ones I'm forgetting, they are absolutely necessary and just as applicable as the next for the, the role of ministry and what that looks like at camp. Um, and, you know, that's the analogy in uh, about the the body of Christ, the church being the body of Christ. Um, It will not function as it should without the eyes or without the hands or without the feet. Um, And it will not reach its full potential unless everybody in the the spot that they are in life um, is is working and striving to uh, be an active part in that ministry. Um, And that, you know, the church just will not function as it should without that, um, the full companionship and partnership and teamwork that um, the Bible calls us to have as the body of Christ. Um, in Isaiah, Isaiah 52, 7 through 10, it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who herald and who proclaim peace and who bring the good news of things and who proclaim salvation uh, and who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voices, shouting for joy together, for every eye will see when the Lord returns to Zion. Be joyful, rejoice together, uh, rejoice together. 
you ruins of Jerusalem, for God has comforted his people and he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has displayed his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and to the ends of the earth we will see the salvation of our God. Now, for the sake of an analogy, I, I read this verse mainly driving at uh, verse uh, 7 where it talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who herald and proclaim peace and who bring news of good things and who proclaim salvation and who says to Zion, your God reigns. Um, this verse is also found in Romans uh, where you know, Paul is talking about how beautiful are the feet of those who do the work of the Lord and who are a part of that ministry and get to um, partake in that and be active in that. Um, and for the sake of an analogy, you know, regarding feet, it sounds kind of goofy, but, um, you know, Pastor Jose, whenever he's up here, he wears his nice gray dress shoes and, um, you know, they look, they look real crisp and um, they're good looking shoes. But um, something that I want to remind you guys of is that, um, you know, beautiful feet does not only apply to my grandparents' feet when they're in Ecuador doing the, the work of the Lord or to my sister Hannah when, you know, she's over in Australia uh, proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel. Um, and just that, you know, it's not just applicable to that kind of work. Um, you know, a, a dusty old pair of cowboy boots or fireman boots or even flip-flops, uh, believe it or not, are just as applicable to ministry as Pastor Jose's nice gray shoes. Now, like I said, I know that sounds kind of like a goofy, uh, a goofy um, illustration there, but I really think that that kind of helps, you know, connect the dots there. I think a lot of people, um, myself included for a period of time, you know, um, pastors and uh, missionaries were kind of looked at as, you know, they're the ones that do that role and I do mine. Um, but we all have uh, a calling to answer um, and the calling is the same for all of us. The Great Commission does not only apply to the, the pastors and to the missionaries. Um, it applies to every single person that has put their faith in Christ that um, the, you know, the Great Commission is is alive and we we need to answer that calling with enthusiasm and zeal um, especially where we are now um, so uh, let's see where I'm losing my train of thought here um, so yeah like I said um, all those lines of work and those pairs of shoes like I said they uh, apply to ministry just like Pastor Jose's nice dress shoes do that he only wears on Sunday morning um, and if the per, uh, but they only apply if the person wearing them is pursuing Christ with reckless abandonment and sharing the gospel like there's no tomorrow. So, what are you doing with the shoes you are in, and are you blending in with your coworkers, or are we being the salt that we are called to be, the salt of the earth? Um, so that brings us to section three. Um, reckless abandonment is what I've titled that. Um, so this is my last point, and uh, I just want to. Um, I hope I've challenged you thus far to live your life as a ministry, but um, let's round this off with some encouragement. And I'm going to do that by reading uh, Ephesians 1, actually, the whole, the whole passage. So, um, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by God's will, grace to you, and peace from, your God, from the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. He predestined us and adopted us through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, um, to be uh, to the praise of his glorious grace and that he favored us uh, in the beloved. <clears throat> we have redemption in him through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to his riches and grace, he has lav uh, that he has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He has made us known. Uh, he has made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, and that He planned uh, in Him for the administration of the days of fulfillment, to bring everything together in the Messiah, uh, both things in heaven and things on earth. Uh, we have also received an inheritance in Him, predestined according to the purpose of the One who works out everything in agreement with the decisions of His predestined, according to the purpose. Of the one, oh, I read that line twice. Oops, my bad. Um, so verse twelve. Um, so that we will, uh, we who had already put our hope in the Messiah might bring praise to His glory. When you heard the message of truth in the gospel of your salvation, and when you you believed in Him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is uh, the down payment of our inheritance, and for the redemption of possession to the praise of His glory. 
This is why I, uh, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love of all the saints, I have never stopped giving thanks to you um, for as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the glorious Father, uh, and the glorious Father would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowing of him. Uh, I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened and that you may know what the, um, what the hope he is calling and what the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints are um, and what the immeasurable greatness of his power um, to us who believe according to the work of his vast strength. Verse 20, he demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him up from the dead and seating him at his right hand. Um, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every given title, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of one, and who fills uh, all things in every way. Um, this verse, or this whole um, chapter, just speaks volumes about. Um, you know, what our walk with the Lord should look like, what our ministry should look like, but also the victory we have through Christ. Oftentimes, myself included, um, I think the, you know, we here in the church, we approach sharing the gospel like it's an, there will be an unknown outcome or an unknown variable. Because, and because of this, we lose confidence. We treat every ministry situation, not, I shouldn't say every, but we treat a lot of ministry situations like um, it's something that, you know, we don't know if it's going to be a win-lose situation. Um, and I'm not saying that it's wrong to be nervous when approaching or tackling a ministry opportunity. I mean, heck, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty nervous standing up here, but um, so I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to be nervous because um, it's not. I think that um, nervousness is natural, and I think that in some cases that can kind of speak to the, the reverence you have for, for what you're about to do and just that, um, you know, being nervous about that can communicate that you think it's a very important message. So I think that can be a good thing. But what I am saying is that as we approach ministry, um, or oftentimes we approach ministry like we are putting up pamphlets and asking people to help win a war or join an army because we need as many people as we can to defeat Satan. And that is not the case. <clears throat> uh, what that verse has to say, or that whole passage has to say, is that our battle is already won. We have the victory through Christ. Um, our roles as missionaries are not to um, recruit soldiers because we need as many people as we can get. It's to proclaim the victory we have in Christ that he claimed 2,000 year, years ago on a cross. Victory that we have no credit in, but that we have every part in through the redemption of Jesus Christ. So yes, it's true that we do not know how people will react when we share the gospel. They might get very angry. They might just be rebellious. They might, um, you know, be judgmental. Yeah, but the point I'm trying to make is that given the victory we have in Christ, that's not really our concern. Um, we share the gospel zealously and um, enthusiastically, and then God will take care of the rest. Um, and if, you know, if, if we communicate the gospel effectively, um, then that brings glory to him. And if we, you know, communicate the, the Bible um, with, with truth and justice and, um, you know, don't mix our words and you know, don't communicate it in a false way, then that brings glory to God, regardless of the outcome and regardless of how the people um, that you're ministering to accept that. That brings glory to God. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, it's true that we don't know how people are going to react when we share the gospel, but our confidence was never meant to come from that assurance that they would accept it. That was never the goal of ministry, is that we could be confident that these people would buy it hook, line, and sinker, and that, um, you know, they would pat us on the back and say, hey man, you're a great missionary. That is never the goal, and that never was the goal. Like I said, the goal is to proclaim the victory that we have in Christ. Um, so, yeah, our confidence comes from the fact that Jesus con conquered, and we get the privilege of spreading that news, regardless of the reaction and regardless of the consequences. And the truth of the matter is we have it very easy here in America. Um, in many countries across the world, people are being killed and martyred for for spreading the gospel. And the fact of the matter is they are doing it anyways. And so we, you know, we have no excuse to not still be pursuing that ministry here in America because we have it easier than 90% of, you know, the people in the world. Um, you know, people all over the world, in China, in North Korea, um, you know, in many other places, they are being persecuted relentlessly. 
Um, and I think oftentimes in America we complain because the air conditioning wasn't high enough or because the seats were uncomfortable at church. Um, and we really, really do not have a place for that, um, that kind of complaining because um, there is a greater calling that we should be answering. And we in America have um, the most resources and we have it the easiest to be able to, pro to answer that call. Um, and to proclaim that message to the people in our homes and the people at work and the people at school um, and just the people we interact with. So, um, but like I said, I'm not saying don't be nervous because that's not, that's not the message I'm trying to convey. It, you know, nervousness is okay, but we should still have confidence in the message that we're bringing. You can be nervous as heck, but still have confidence in the message that you're displaying because it's the word of God and the word of truth. Um, and you can have confidence in that. Uh, excuse me. Um, to go back to what I said earlier about Jesus being a carpenter. Yes, that is true. And five of the apostles were fishermen. Paul was a tent maker. My grandpa was a bush pilot. My dad a truck driver. My mom a mom. And I'm working at camp. Um, many of you, uh, you know, we have quite a few firemen in the church. We have um, many veterans, which, by the way, thank you for your service with uh, it being Memorial Day. Um, you know, this, this applies to, to uh, being in the military also, but um, we, have, we have veterans and we have a whole lot of people in this church that are retired, but we all know what that means. Oftentimes, many of the people that in this church that are retired work more than they do when they had an occupation, but um, the calling is still alive and the responsibility remains the same. So take action and live out that responsibility with a shameless and reckless abandonment for the things of this world and with full devotion to the mission that we have in Christ. What I mean by reckless abandonment um, is pretty much what I just said, that you have reckless abandonment for the things of this world. You're ready to throw all those away in, um, in the hopes and in the um, zealousness and enthusiasm of being able to share the gospel. The things of this world should be very, very, very low or not even on your priority list. Um, and you should have reckless abandonment and be willing to abandon all of those things for the sake of sharing the gospel. That's something that I struggle with personally. Um, and so I just want you guys to know I'm not just coming up here to point the finger. This is very much applicable to me in my life. Um, and it's something that I struggle with constantly. It's just that, you know, some of the things in this world and some of the luxuries here are pretty nice. But um, the fact of the matter is that is not, this is not our home. This is not our permanent place. And um, our home is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should be... Um, you know, we say that all the time, but oftentimes we don't act like it and we act like this is our home. But the fact of the matter is it's not. And heaven is our home and we should want to be proclaiming that to the rest of the world. So, like I said, take action and live out that responsibility with shameless and reckless abandonment for things of this world and full devotion to the mission that we have in Christ, the Great Commission. Um, so uh, with that, I'm just kind of going to close it off with uh, some prayer time like Pastor Jose normally does. Um, so I got a few questions for you, and then, and then I'll close in prayer. Um, so number one, do you feel like uh, you know, you've lost your zeal or your enthusiasm or even your drive? That can go for your personal relationship with Christ or what we've been talking about uh, where it's in regards to sharing the gospel. Um, I think becoming idle in your personal relationship with Christ is very easy. But, you know, for those of you that don't struggle with that, um, you know, it can be difficult to uh, still have that drive and enthusiasm for sharing the gospel. So if you feel like, you know, you've lost your zeal and your enthusiasm and your drive, I want to I want to pray with you this morning. Uh, number two, are you unsure why God has placed you where you are? Does your work seem uh, pointless and you feel like you're at a dead end job? Or do you feel like your schooling is not going anywhere and you just are, feel like you're wasting time? Has the monotony of your work become overwhelming and do you feel like you are achieving nothing? I want to pray with you and I want to encourage you that that is not the case. As I said before, God has placed you where you are for a reason. Um, there is not, uh, you know, and oftentimes we don't know what that reason is, um, you know, but there is a time and a place that God has called you to be and you are right where that is right now. Um, so I can't tell you what that reason is, but I can tell you that there is a reason. And, well, I can tell you that it's probably somehow or another so that you can be a living testimony to, to the people you're surrounded by. And, um, you know, you should be sharing the gospel where you are. That's, that's what I'm trying to tell, tell you. But, um, but, yeah, are you unsure why God has placed you where you are? Uh, I want to pray with you this morning. Um, and number three, do you feel like you often forget about the victory we have in Christ? And is that affecting your confidence in sharing the gospel? Like I said, um, 
you know, we, we approach ministry, myself included sometimes, we approach ministry as if it's an unknown variable and an unknown outcome, and we don't know how these people are going to react, which is true. But the confidence of the message we are sharing should be our, our motivation and our driving factor, and that should be what we take joy in, what we find our enthusiasm is in, and what we find our strength in. Um, so do you feel like you've forgotten, you, at times you forget about that victory, and you kind of let it sweep itself under the rug, and then you get, you get nervous and overwhelmed by the things of this world. I want to pray with you this morning. So with that, uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Um, dear Lord, I want to thank you for this day, and I, just, I want to thank you for this congregation. Um, I want to lift up uh, just whoever is, is watching this right now, and just I pray that you would encourage them and just um, help them to understand that uh, the victory that uh, we have in you is very, very enduring, and um, the grace we have in you is very, very enduring, and that there is a reason that they are where they're at right now, whether that be occupation-related or um, schooling-related or even just a state of mind. Um, I pray that you would just encourage them and just let them know that you are there with them. Um, I pray that if they feel like they've lost their um, zeal or their enthusiasm for your message, I pray that you would just... Um, reignite that in them and light a fire in them and um, just that they would be you would use them like never before that they would um, share the gospel with reckless abandonment and um, just just really really drive and pursue a relationship with you stronger than it was yesterday um, and even uh, I pray that it'll be even stronger tomorrow um, so I, I, I pray that you would be with them um, and I pray that you would just remind this congregation and um, the Christians all across the world that the victory they have is in you. Our, our victory and our, our inheritance is sealed. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. And um, we, we should take joy in that and take um, pride in what you did, not anything of our own doing, but take pride in that. So I pray that um, we would just be able to understand that and just take joy in the victory that we have with you. Um, and I just pray that you would bless the rest of our week as we go into this next week. And I pray that um, you would keep this congregation safe and um, that you would just let the person watching this know that you love them. Uh, in your name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, have a great rest of your week. And I'll be praying for you. Um, and just thanks for hearing me out a little bit and just hearing about camp and the, the ministry that I'm a part of. And I hope that, um, you know, you've been challenged and uh, just and uh, encouraged uh, through this. So thanks a lot.